You're listening to the 40 Fit Radio Podcast, dedicated to the 40 plus community. Join us as we discuss the truth about fitness and health using science, reason, and the experiences of our host and content experts. Welcome to the 40 Fit Nation. Hey, welcome back to the 40 Fit Radio and welcome back to the 40 Fit Nation. This is Coach D here and Coach Trent. Morning, folks. And uh, we are here lovely Texas morning on a Tuesday morning doing a podcast. And today we're going to talk about posture and aging and really just posture in general. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of comments and requests, uh, especially in my clinical practice. We talk about improving posture, changing posture, affecting posture, and really First of all, what is posture and and um, and and how to how to incorporate or uh, let's put it this way, how to adapt your training to improve or definitely to uh, maintain posture or to uh, make a difference in uh, your postural position. So, yeah, um, a lot of people um, think they have poor posture, right, which they may or may not. Um, And so I think, you know, maybe we need to start with. First of all, what, what, what is poor posture? And then is it even an issue? Yeah. So let's talk about what what myself, what I think as is, is a doctor of physical therapy or as a PT, what I think normal posture should look like. Let's, let's, let's create a framework of what quote unquote normal is first and then how there are deviations from the norm, which ones are more important than others or more significant than others and what can we do about it? Uh, in our training or daily lives or in our work settings uh, in regard when it comes to ergonomics and our work life too. Right. So normal posture would be measured basically on a plumb, plumb line model. So if I took a plumb line, if I took a string and I hung it from the ceiling with a little counterweight on it and I hung the string straight down, then it gives us a perfectly vertical line. If I lined up an individual, a patient or an individual, a trainee, to the plumb line and have them stand directly with the middle of their body beside the plumb line. Here is what I should see if we had what we would call normal posture, okay? The plumb line should line up basically with the middle or slightly anterior to their earlobe. Okay. Okay, in the middle of their head. It should go down and then bisect basically the middle of the shoulder or their acromion process, all right, on their shoulder. Then it should go down and bicep the, uh, bisect the elbow, the middle of the elbow. The hands might be slightly forward of that because there's a little bend in the elbow, so they will not necessarily be aligned with the posture line. Then as we're going down, there should be a nice, um, at, from the top of the spine, when we come to the head, there should be a nice um, anterior or concave curve of the cervical spine, and then a slight... Um, convex curve of the thoracic spine and then a slight concave curve again of the lumbar spine so basically a a really open looking double s almost right yes or an s plus (laughs) um and so there's if we consider the sacrum and the coccyx that's the bottom of the s so it should look like a double s basically for like a better terminology right um but it's a very but it's a very open or a very shallow s in regards to the curves okay the plumb line should then come down through the middle of the thorax through the middle of the rib cage and the trunk and then hit the middle of what we call the greater trochanter of the hip okay or those bones that are on the outside of your hip then it should go down and bisect Um, the knee, basically, and come right down through the knee, okay, through the middle of the knee, and then come down to what we call the lateral malleolus of the foot or the fibula at the bottom of the foot and the ankle joint, okay? So we should have this nice alignment all the way up and down the chain where the ear, the middle of the shoulder, shoulder, the thorax, the spinal curve, the hip joint, the knee joint, and the ankle joint are generally close to alignment of that straight vertical line. That's what we would call normal posture. Sure. Now, there are a lot of areas within individual joints, like the hip joint and the knee joint and the ankle joint, and we could that's that's a view basically in the frontal plane. Okay? That's not looking at them in the sagittal plane. That's looking at them in the frontal plane. 
Um, so I can also look at posture in the in the sagittal plane, but I'm looking at it in a frontal view. And I could look at ankle joint posture. Do they have do they have pes planus, uh, pes cavus? In other words, are they over pronated or under pronated? Um, are there are do they, are they do they have what we call being knock kneed, which is genu valgus or genu varus? Are their knees out? Are they bow legged? In other words, um, is there tibial torsion? Is there femoral torsion? Um, uh, there's all these different things. Are they anteriorly rotated? When they stand normally, do I see their palms or do I see the, the side of their hands, like their thumb and index finger, or do I see um, the back of their hand for if when they relax normally? Um, and so there's all sorts of things. Do they have normal cervical posture? Are they side bent to one side or another or laterally shifted? Is the same thing in the spine. So there's all different things. So I can look at posture from several different angles. I can look at posture from the frontal plane, the sagittal plane, or the transverse plane, those three planes. So frontal, uh, sagittal, or transverse. Transverse would be just cutting them right down the middle, looking down through the top, okay? So, but general normal posture, we look through a plumb line. And uh, we measure, you know, that posture in relationship to that straight vertical line. And once we get a general view of their posture, then we can look at specific regions like spinal posture and shoulder joint posture and things like that. So yeah, and, and, a, it's a lot to consider, a lot to look at. And usually my attention is drawn to areas that are symptomatic, meaning when I'm in the clinic, I, I'm looking at their posture in relationship to the problem they're presenting with. Right, right. Yeah, I'm glad you pointed that out because um, as a coach, you know, we see lots of variation, natural variation yeah. in the human amount anomalies. of anomalies. Yeah. Yeah. Humans are, by the way, humans are not symmetrical. Right. Right. We're, We're definitely not, not symmetrical. symmetrical. <laughs> yeah. I know I've got uh, this actually, uh, Brent Carter, uh, the starting strength coach, pointed this out at the last seminar that I attended. Uh, he was on the, the magically platform. strong leprechaun. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. He is kind of like a leprechaun. Yeah. Hobbit leprechaun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Brent. I love you, man. I love you, Brent. <laughs> he he does a great uh, impression of Rip, mm -hmm, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, spot on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, you know, he he stopped for a second. He's like, "Do you have scoliosis?" I'm like, I I don't know. I don't think so. He said, "I think you got a little scoliosis." Called Rip over. Rip, does he have scoliosis? Yeah, he's got a little scoliosis. But who cares? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Who cares? Yeah. It's fine. I don't have any symptoms. No pain. I can deadlift fine. My movement look quality is great. So there is. Um, that's one thing. First of all, when we talk about posture to point out is that there's lots of variation in what we would consider like an ideal or perfect posture with that, the anatomical uh, model in the textbook, right? And, and if there's no symptoms, it's probably... Or dysfunctional or movement. Or dysfunctional movement. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're moving on through life and, and you have no symptoms, no diagnosed problems and no, you know, dysfun significantly dysfunctional movement, human movement, whether it be in daily life, training or work then um, I really don't care if you have a postural, postural anomaly. Or, yeah, don't worry you know, about it. There's a certain amount of acceptable variance outside the norm. And right. what that is varies from individual to individual. There's not a set guideline. I mean, I'm sure there are some set guidelines, but I don't adhere to them, and I don't, I don't um, rely on them per se other than what I consider to be normal. Yeah. Um, and then from there, if I present, for example, if, I, if, if, if someone comes in and they present with shoulder pain, and they present with, um, uh, let's say, uh, posterior shoulder pain when they go overhead, okay, or superior anterior or, or superior posterior superior shoulder pain, top and back when they go overhead, and they're highly thoracically kyphotic. In other words, they have a rounded upper back. They're rounded forward, and they can't fully elevate or raise their arms overhead because of structural postural. Um, uh, adaptation, you know, they've, they've got a structural lack of shoulder flexion, um, then that's important because the symptom matches the postural anomaly. And then that may be something that I might try to improve the postural dysfunction if it's improvable. So, so let's go down that road. Now let's talk okay. about that yep. and talk about, first of all, I'll just tell you this. I, I don't care what movement specialist you're going to, what kinetic movement expert you're going to certified this or certified that, um, functional movement screening. I'm certified. I'm, I've been through the SFMA, uh, uh, the now I can't remember what it stands for. FMS um, I've heard of. Functional well, movement FMS screen. is functional movement screening, but SFMA is structural 
functional movement analysis. And uh, it's an offshoot of FMS, basically. And um, it's like every yeah, buzzword and, just lined up. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, and there's <laughs> a there's a you know an algorithm that you use with individuals to. And I and I'll be honest with you, I use some of those things in my mind's eye. Sure. Just to create a, a thinking template to be able to draw the causalgia, you know, and to be able to um, analyze patients or or trainees when I'm working with them in the clinic or in the gym. Um, but I, but also, you know, you can go to all these movement specialists and they would tweak you this way and tweak you that way. And all of a sudden it's miraculous. Nine times out of 10, I, I really believe that's placebo. I, I really believe it's, it's something that's in our minds more than it is our bodies because the human body is, is extremely durable and, um, adaptive to slight variations from the norm and even major variations from the norm. It's extremely adaptable. And some of that's our only, some of that is only limited by our, our mental adaptability, right? Our ability to, like I tell people all the time, that person has a, um, has an intolerance for exercise or they have a, um, exertional sensitivity is what I call it. And that just means that, that, you know, physically they think they lack, but really it's more a mental lack than it is anything right, else. Right. And so, um, we all like to find the one thing or we, based on your personality, we all like to find that the, the magical problem that needs to be fixed. And most times than not, um, there's really nothing that needs to be fixing. We just need to work through the problem. And so, but when we're talking about major variations, um, those things need to be addressed sometimes if they, if they produce uh, painful movement, significantly dysfunctional movement, that's going to be a problem in the future. Um, and I'll give you a great example of that in just a minute, or um, a situation that it, it's, it's, a, it's not allowing you to do something you need to do in life. Right. Um, a good example would be if a patient comes to me and they have an arthritic knee and the knee lacks full extension, they can't fully straighten their knee when they walk. And the knee's always loaded. The quads are always active. The patellofemoral joints always compressed and they have a minus 20 degree lag. They can't fully lock it out when they walk. That person is more likely to have osteoarthritis of the knee and have more problems and probably have to have a total knee replacement earlier in life. We want to try to avoid that. And so we might want to work on knee extension to improve the quality of knee extension um, to improve the problem in the future, potentially. Because right. that's a dysfunctional movement pattern that we got to fix. Um, so those are th that's a good example of a problem that, that may not necessarily be symptomatic, um, but it could become a problem in the future because we, now we have some studies that show that if you can't fully extend the knee, you're probably going to have early onset arthritis of the joint, and then it's going to be painful, and you're going to eventually have to have a knee replacement sooner than later. Yeah, so, yeah. So... Yeah. And, and, you know, in the gym, we were talking about this earlier in the gym. Uh, another common thing we see is um, people that lack that overhead mobility in the yeah. press. Yeah. And it's something yeah. that may not, you know, and it could be either structural, like a kyphosis that's causing them. They just can't um, fully extend the shoulder. Sure. Or it could be or, or flex the shoulder or it, it could functional. be. Um, yeah. F functional, just like a muscular yeah. tightness issue. But it's something that. um we we might see we we might see it lower loads um, that's not necessarily an issue but it causes issues at higher loads because yeah. they they can't properly perform can't get to the say like out. a press and they can't lock yeah. it out and that might ultimately limit their strength um, you know so it may keep them from getting strong prematurely yeah yeah gaining the mobility over time if it's gainable is important to improve the quality of movement to improve progression in the strength training program right it'd be the same thing in any sport though too if you were a swimmer and you couldn't get couldn't get full overhead shoulder elevation um, then your chest would be lifted up out of the water some your hips would be dropped down some you'd be creating more drag than you need to if we just improve your shoulder mobility which most likely will occur through training right um, then and through some sport uh, and through uh, doing your sport too, then um, and we may do some stretching outside dynamically, but but then you're automatically going to improve your performance because you can get in the better position, and um, and that might be that might be the that may be the low hanging fruit fruit that might be low hanging fruit. It might be the thing that that's going to take you to the next level, but it really doesn't involve getting stronger necessarily. It involves improving posture. So. The first thing we need to look at when we think about posture is that, first of all, folks, guess what? It's highly genetic. If you look at your parents 
and you look at your siblings, you'll see that there's a very similar postural trait. You can look at a grandfather, a father, and a son, and a grandson standing next to each other, and based on where they are in their life cycle, you'll see some very similar postural traits. We, we, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, usually, unless the milkman was involved. And so, you know, there's, there's, um, there, there's, there's usually a strong genetic predisposition to structural and functional postural adaptations. You have a certain genomic expression and you can, um, you may be maximizing that gene expression or you may be under, you, you, you may be actually maximizing the bad things of your gene expression, or you might be maximizing the good things, or you might be kind of somewhere kind of in the middle. Our goal through this podcast and other things that we do with our clients, both with my clients, both, both in the clinic and in the gym is to get the good gene expression maximized. And posture is one of those areas, but posture is highly genetic. If your father has um, ankylosing spondylitis, which has a strong genetic predisposition to, um, which is what we, you know, call, there's a kyphosis of the upper back and a stiffness of it, and sometimes the lower back too, so there's a flexing forward where you look like you have a hump on your back. Um, you're more susceptible to that because there is a strong genetic predisposition to that problem, that diagnosis, that disorder. Um, now, will strength training and exercise help you not be so bent forward? Potentially so. Um, it, it might help if we work on developing the posterior, the muscles of the back, the muscles of the upper back. It definitely can't hurt. Um, but um, a lot of times environmental factors can be a, a part of that too. So um, the, the second thing to look at that, that, that really influences posture would be, like we said, environmental factors. Um, it might be that you have a job and you've sat at your desk for 40 years or 30 years and you've been in a forward flex posture yeah. all your life. Shoulders hunched forward over the keyboard. Exactly. Maybe your monitor's not in the right place. Exactly. And so there might need to be a work fit done. But if you're, I'm going to just tell you something, if you're 60 years old and you've been in a desk for 30 years, assuming the same posture, we might be able to make you feel better through exercise and training and treatment. Um, but, and, and we might be able to adapt your workstation, but there may be some structural versus functional changes that we're not going to change. They, they just are what they are, but that doesn't mean necessarily that we can't make you asymptomatic. Um, we might not necessarily be able to influence the, the structure, but we might be able to influence the function. And so it's, it's really, it gets kind of complicated in there. And so, yeah. but genetics are the first thing. And the second thing would be environmental factors. Um, and, um, a good example would be if you're a bench press specialist and you, um, have spent most of your life as a high school kid all the way up into your fifties doing really nothing but the bench press, you're going to be very forward and rounded and, and big through the pecs and big through the anterior deltoids and lats. And so you're going to have this forward shoulder posture. Some of that could be functional that over time could become a structural, um, uh, problem. And so w let's talk about the difference between functional and structural. Um, and we talked about two of our friends, close friends that are lifters. Um, so we're going to call you out on the podcast, guys. So Scott Hamburg and Matt Reynolds yeah. of um, uh, Barbell Logic Podcast and and, uh, and also Online Great Books with Scott Hamburg and then also Starting Strength Online Coaching with Matt Reynolds. If you take those two two guys, Scott has a, a, a significant structural kyphosis of his upper back. In other words, his thoracic spine in between his shoulders is rounded, and it's structurally rounded. The ligaments are tight there. He's rounded that way. How he got there, I have no idea. It could be genetics. I, I, I haven't seen a picture of his dad uh, since he, they did that podcast. But, I mean, I didn't know. You know, you could look at his parents. Right. Um, you could look at his siblings if he has siblings. But but there's that kyphosis, okay? So it puts the shoulder forward. It puts the, the scapulas forward. And it makes him more rounded. For him to get into an overhead lockout position into full elevation is very difficult because the scapula starts forward to start with. And there's a two to one ratio after about um, 60 degrees. There's a two to one ratio of, of rotation with um, uh, humeral uh, flexion or elevation. And so at some point, his scapula start forward so they just can't rotate upward as highly. Right. as a normal shoulder would. So it's so it's an it's a aberration from the norm. It's an anomaly. And it's a large enough anomaly that it does affect his overhead lockout 
And it will affect his progression and strength training some overhead just because he can't get into that natural anatomical resting position overhead where it's locked out. Right, right. And you think about with, with a certain amount of load on the bar in an overhead press. Um, the if, bar's going to be forward. Yeah, if that bar is forward at all of, of his midfoot, then, you know. It's heavier. Yeah, it exactly. This is a moment. You just, yeah, exactly. That moment force gets, uh, you know, you can't now, overcome it at some point. Now, just because I think it's a structural postural problem doesn't mean that I wouldn't work with Scott to develop the upper back. So I might do upper back exercises. I might um, work on hangs with him to, to stretch the lats out too, to make sure that he doesn't have lat tightness, um, which he probably does. Um, I might give him some some dynamic uh, pec stretches to work on that. And, but, and I am gonna work on things that pull him upright. So work on the back of his shoulder just as much as I do in the front of his shoulder. Um, and so uh, try, try to offset some of that. But that is more a structural issue. It's right. a bony, ligamentous joint problem that, that probably is going to be there. And I'm not going to impact how it looks that much. I might be able to impact his performance with little tweaks here and there. And then you take uh, Matt for ex an example. Matt, I believe, you know, he, he does have some thoracic kyphosis but not quite as much as Scott does. And probably some of his internal rotation and anterior shoulder position is just because he's done, he's been a power lifter, a strong man most of his career in life, um, since his late teens, I think. He's been lifting and he's developed all these anterior muscular. He's also got a lot of scar tissue from pec tears and, right, and, right. Um, and he's got lat tightness. Um, but if I were to pick two guys and if I were to predict which one I could eventually get in a better overhead position, it would definitely be Matt. Right. Because I think that less of his problem is structural, even though some of it is, and more of it is functional, meaning it's it's tissue that I might be able to affect change with through a dynamic stretching program and through certain interventions with him. So we've got this concept of structural versus functional, and it doesn't mean that you have to give up on working on your posture, but it does mean that your expectation level might change with an individual. Yeah. You know, if I have a woman that comes into my clinic and she's 75, 80 years old, and she's got osteoporosis and she's all bent over forward, I can strengthen her and I might be able to improve her posture some, but it may be that over the last 75, 80 years, she has this structural bony changes. I'm not making that better. So, but it, I can make her function better. Sure, can make her function. Better. And that that was the Get example. Get stronger. That, that was the example that that came to mind first. Is you know you see the the little old lady that's hunched over um, with the that dowager's hump, yeah. right? Yeah. And um and, and I was thinking I was like okay so yeah maybe those ladies already had um you know some some noticeable kyphosis before they developed the hump, but would strength training at some point earlier in their life have prevented the bony changes that created the, the, the hump. Right. I don't so, know. Yeah. I don't know. I, that's, you'd have to do a case study or, or, and I'd have to go out and look at the literature and see if there's anything in the literature that shows that strength training, resistance training, and it would need to be a fairly large study. I mean, I mean, at, at least it'd be a small group study or a case study first to see. Um, and then it would have to be longitudinal. It would have to be over the course of 20, 30, 40 years. Right, right. So it's a hard study to do um, and to get people to do consistently. But the real, yeah, so the question would be if we had her do exercises that were trunk exercises that worked on right. uprightness, yeah. press. press, deadlift, back squat, all these things, would she have better posture today? I don't know, but I can say this she would have a better bony health. She'd have better bone density. She'd have better function. She'd be stronger. And and my 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 uh, my intuition is, and just my background says that she's probably going to have better posture too. But I, I can't quantify that right now. How much better posture? Right. But right. to me, if the posture is not that much better, but the function is better, that's a win. That's yeah. A exactly. Win. Exactly. Yeah. It is what it is. And, right. And but I, I have uh, athletes or lifters that come in the gym and people that come in my clinics and and they don't necessarily have great posture, but they're extremely functional. So, yeah, I, I okay. only look at fixing posture if it creates dysfunction or could create dysfunction in the future or so, has pain associated. So the next time your mom tells you to stand up straight, you can tell her, <laughs> say, Mom, Ma, Ma. I'm squatting, you know, I'm pressing, yeah, I'm deadlifting, yeah. I'm doing what I can. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, the beautiful thing about resistance training, 
with a barbell especially is, is that we teach a normal anatomical position of the spine. It's not actually straight. It looks straight when you look at the trunk, but there is a nice curve in the low back. There's a slight thoracic um, uh, kyphosis or roundedness, and then there's a nice curve in the cervical spine. But we teach that in barbell training because it's required mechanically to move the bar. So teaching that position develops those musculature in that position. So if you've got bad posture, the best thing you can do is, number one, a strength training program that's well-balanced, that's well-balanced, that works the back of your body just as it does the front of your body. Um, and that means you need to be pulling, and that means you need to be pushing, and that needs means you need to be overhead pressing, and that means you need to be doing some type of squat. Right. All of those areas need to be worked. That's one way to work your posture. Posture is best influenced by developing the, the, the strength and the development of the musculature and the bony structures in the position we want you to be in. Yeah. Awareness is important. The awareness that when I'm sitting, upright posture is important, but it's much easier to do and maintain if I've got good musculature that are starting at a higher strength level and they don't get as fatigued throughout the day. Right, right. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Logically, um, yeah, if you've got a real strong, real strong abs and spinal erectors from squatting and deadlifting, then it's pretty easy to stand upright, sit upright for long periods of time. Yeah, you would think so. But then again, we go back to the idea that habits, right, probably our habits create our posture, our surroundings and our environment create our posture, and then our, our genetics create our posture. Those are probably the three big influences. Genetics, Number one, number two, environmental um, uh, uh, environmental forces or environmental influences, and then number three, our habits. Um, those all three things influence our posture. So, if you're if you're bent over at your desk all day long, you're promoting for hours and hours and hours a flexed posture, a forward bent posture. Um, that needs to be counteracted through training, or through uh, more importantly. A, an ergonomic assessment of your workstation to improve your workstation so that you can become more upright. Um, and now, then again, um, some people live their lives that way and never have a single problem with it. But, you know, the closer we can get you to the norm, the better. But I also want to want to put a uh, disclaimer there to say there's nothing to show that someone with more closer to norm posture is necessarily healthier than someone who's not. Right. Um, it's all about function and it's all about do people present with problems. And when people present with problems, we like to fix them. We like to fix problems before they get to be a problem. If we know that there are things that significantly can influence people's uh, health in the future, we like to fix those problems before they become a problem. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, preventative absolutely. medicine type thing. Um, but, you know, I'm an ergonomist, too. Um, I used to do a lot of worksite uh, visits. I used to do ergonomic evaluations of people's uh, CRT, their computer stations. I used to do it on assembly lines. I did it for a company that made um, uh, a jewelry where they had a lot of bench work they were doing. I've done it in a lot of different applications where there's this human machine or human workforce inter uh, interface. And there are things that we can do in our work environment to improve our posture. And if we work eight to 10 hours a day, that's a big deal. Right, right. So the more that we can get you in better posture, just like when we're lifting, we want you in the proper posture because mechanically it's more efficient and it produces a better result with less risk for injury. Sure, sure. And so that's, well, that's the key. Let's uh, let's break that down a little bit. All right, so let's talk about workstations. Um, all right, so I'm sitting in my battle station. Um, it's a desk. I'm in a seated position. Maybe that's a good place to start. If I have the option for standing desks, do you recommend that? Yeah, I think it, I think you do both. You you'll have some sitting during your day, and you'll have some standing during your day. If you could, what I like to do is tell people to sit for thirty minutes and stand for thirty minutes. Sit and stand, just alternate between roughly the two. half time. Half. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good start, um, and it's all based on people's individual health. But I think that's a good start. Um, no matter what, when we're in a sitting or standing posture, we want the computer screens to be basically no more than about eighteen to uh, the eighteen to uh, twenty. 25 inches in front of our face so that the focal distance is good for, for um, uh, focusing on the, the computer screen. Number two, we want our wrist to basically be in neutral or a little bit of extension, so slightly cocked up. We don't want to be resting our wrist or 
uh, carpal tunnel region or wrist joint right on a hard surface, if at all possible. Um, we want our elbows to be roughly at 90 degrees or maybe even just a little bit more open than that. So roughly next to our side and down to our side, just relaxed like we would be standing, holding a tray in a line. Like if we were holding a tray mm -hmm. in a cafeteria line, that's about the position we want our elbows and our wrists to be in um, when we're at our workstation. And we want our hip joints to basically be at 90 degrees. So we want our back up nice and straight. And we want our hips, at our hip angle flexed to about 90 degrees. And our knees at about 90 degrees. And our feet firmly rested on the floor if we were sitting. That's the general position we want to be in. So it's a really nice upright posture that if we lined a plumb line up, we would see the plumb line would line up between our ear, our shoulder, and our hip. And then drop directly down to the bottom of the floor. Um, and then obviously our knees and ankles would be in front of that. Um, but our knees would be directly aligned over our ankle and our ankle would be directly underneath our knees. Okay. If that makes yeah. sense. If we looked at a second plumb line. So yeah, that's, that's something I see a lot is, um, a chair, especially fixed height chairs yeah. that, yeah. uh, that aren't appropriate for your limb lengths. If you have only, if you can only get the balls of your feet on the floor, you end up tucking them up underneath your knees. Sure. Your so your toes, sure. you're on your toes, tucked up underneath your knees and you tend to hunch forward. You don't have any support yeah. against the ground, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the issues with the modern era we have with tablet devices, smart devices, phones, you know, people are bent forward. They're texting all day long. Oh yeah. In a flex right. position. There's no monitor there. There's not a traditional workstation anymore per se with a lot of our, uh, interaction with the, with the, um, uh, uh computer world today or the internet, whatever you want to call it with technology, there's not a lot of consistent interaction, um, at a typical workstation anymore. So you could be spending your whole work day with a laptop in your lap. It's not good posture, you know, and you're all flexed over and hunched over and it's just not good posture. Um, is it going to, pro is it going to cause a problem long-term? I don't know. I can't predict yeah, too that. many factors, right? Right. But, right. There's but. just too many factors involved and, and people's genetics, and environmental factors, all those things. But if I had a choice to pot, to position you in a more, more normal posture, I would, because that would help to limit your risk for postural pain, postural dysfunction, stress on your low back. Um, uh, cause we know that, that sitting produces, you know, about seven times the force that standing does on your low back. And so we, we want to get you into a better posture just so that you can, um, assume a more normal uh, position. So, you know, there, there are some important things to look at there. And I think the, the big overreaching concept here is this, is that strength training influences posture and more importantly, it influences function. And that's really what we're looking at is function, but also that genetics, environmental factors and habits really are probably the g big generators that are going to shape your posture and whether or not we would consider it quote unquote normal or not. If you don't have pain or dysfunction and you're able to do everything you need to do, then it may be that your posture is fine. Um, and it may be a little outside the norm. That's fine. But if you've got something that's dysfunctional in lifting or daily life or recreation or sport, and you're not able to do something you want to do, then posture should be looked at. And then it should be assessed as to whether or not it can be corrected. And no matter what, even if it's not corrected in regards to its measurements, if we interact with strength training, which I think strength training is the key to proper posture, awareness first and then strength training second. Yeah, um, by the you way, you got to be aware. Yeah, let me let, and let me just stop you there really quick. Um, one thing that I've noticed is I have a tendency, especially, you know, I need to get a new chair in my home studio where I work during the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I've noticed that I'll tend to slouch over time, you know, as I get tired or just, you know, get uncomfortable and I need to shift around. I'll tend to slouch and then lean forward or tilt my pelvis forward in the sure, chair. Sure. And I get the, I, I pull my lumbar into overextension in the process. One thing that uh, strength training has made me very aware of is when I'm doing that, because yeah, I know yeah. from the gym, I know the difference between normal extension and an overextension. And so I'll catch myself doing that and I'll pull it back up. I don't think, you know, it doesn't prevent me from doing that over time, right? I probably yeah, a better chair yeah. would, but it does give me awareness that I probably wouldn't have had had I not spent all the time strength training and being really aware of what my back was doing. Yeah, I mean, the training that you've had in barbell training also helps you with lifting something, you know, at the house or right. picking something up out of your car or up off the ground if you're working in your yard or whatever. I mean, posture can be static, mm -hmm. being still, or it can be dynamic. 
you're doing something and you're assuming proper posture during that activity. Sure. So we yeah. have static posture and we have dynamic posture. Both are important and both need to be trained if we haven't had proper training. So awareness and education comes first and then following through with a strengthening program, whether it be in a clinical setting when I'm working with patients or whether it's in our gym, um, it's the same intervention, uh, maybe a little different population. My gym member may be asymptomatic and no pain, but it might be influencing function. So there is a symptom and the symptom is poor function. So I need to improve that. So it might influence how I program their strength training to work. I mean, they might be crazy strong in the bench press, but weak in the press and weak in the overhead position or weak in getting down into the squat. I might back off on their bench press for a while and work on developing that posterior chain, work on developing their back. And I might put some row activity in. I might put some dynamic stretches in. And so it will influence how I'm going to train that individual because I'm trying to improve function overall the symptom is the lack of function it may not be pain it may not be something that's that's bothering them but it's just they're bothered by the fact they can't do something yeah and so you know we have a lot of different reasons why we influence this posture but i think it's important to recognize that you know if you go to someone and i mean i tell you what if you go to someone they tell you they're going to fix your posture um you know i you know, I, I want to see you <laughs> and I want to figure out what your postural problem is. And then I'll tell you honestly whether or not it can be fixed. I might save you a lot of money, by the way. Um, yeah, those, but, those functional movement screens aren't cheap. No, no. And just seeing a postural so. or a movement specialist or whatever. But, but um, and, and I think there's value in analyzing human movement. Um, but I think th- we have a lot of people that we know, you and I know, that don't necessarily have great movement and are extremely functional extremely able and have no symptoms. So there's not necessarily a cause and effect there. Um, I'm only going to address the problem if I think professionally that I see a problem in the future from this. And I'm very careful with that, not to over evaluate that or over assess that. Um, Or number two, you're presently having a problem that we need to fix. So yeah, man, great talk on posture and um, some of the, the things that cause postural problems. Um, what the big takeaway home today is, is that posture is highly genetic, influenced by your environmental factors and also influenced by your daily habits. Number one, get involved in a strengthening program that develops a good spinal upright posture. You don't need to have good posture before you start training. No, train right. to build good posture. Right. Yeah, it's it's a definitely not, you don't have to have it. But get in there and strengthen those core musculature that they, you know, experts call them build your trunk musculature the core build the core um and um and you know that can be done through the big compound movements it can also be done through dynamic stretching you can help your posture it can also be done by adaptive changes at your workstation or in your recreational activities Um, and this is all going to influence your function which is what we're all about it's all about function it's not about not about fixing you to make you quote unquote normal. So thanks for joining us today on the 40 fit radio podcast. Thanks for joining the 40 fit nation. If you'd like to get some more information about 40 fit, go to 40 fit.com and you can also go to the 40 fit radio tab. You can also email us at info at 40 fit.com. We'll answer any questions that you might have. Hey, comment on our social media post on our Instagram, which is at 40 fit radio. Trent's personal Instagram is at Marmalade Cream and mine is at DL Deaton. And then you can also find us at 40 Fit Masters Community Group on Facebook. But uh, man, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love for you to share our podcast. That's how we make our podcast get out to more people and spread the good news. But man, we'd love to having you guys today. And um, hey, have a great day. See you next week.